everybody, Jordan Ricardo, EvergladesPhotographer.com. So I'm at the Monroe Station, on what's left of it. To see it in pictures is a totally different thing than to being here. When you're here, it gets real fast. It kind of hurts like you lost somebody you knew. Kind of like you lost a best friend. Even though I really didn't get a chance to experience Monroe Station, the sadness of it being gone will echo forth out here. Hey everybody, George here. So I'm hanging out here with uh, Richard Oliman. Richard's an awesome guy. He remembers Monroe Station ever so well. So we're just driving down Loop Road, talking about Monroe Station, and uh, his story started coming up, and I said, man, Richard, we, we gotta record this. So even though he didn't want to, he's gonna actually tell you the stories of Monroe Station. Well, it, we were talking about memories of the place. I started going out there when I was a kid, about 1970. My dad used to take us, me and my friends, out to here to Loop Road, and we learned how to shoot. You know, we're about 10 years old. By by 11, we were roaming all over the place, and uh, you know, we used to spend weekends out here, and you can always go get a hot meal over there. With the Lord, <laughs> that was his actual name, Mr. Lord. But I was telling George, you know, he looked like Wild Bill Hickok to me. That's why I remember him. You know, he had the long white hair with the hat, and he had a, the long white goatee, and he looked like a, a old Western character. And he was really a cool old guy. His wife was so nice. They always served up great food you could get, you know, for breakfast. All right, go. Yeah, go, go, baby. Most people don't remember uh, uh, Joe Lord and his uh, wife, Sue, Sweet Sue. It's always Sweet Sue at Monroe Station, but before that, before they had it, uh, Dixie Webb had it. He was a real redneck. He looked like General Lee. He wore his rebel cap, he had the gray beard, yeah. and, uh, and an attitude. <coughs> and uh, his daughter also lived there and worked there with him, upstairs. And he, um, he was a bigot. Yeah, here, let me turn this around to make sure it's lucky Spiker speak easy as that. Anyway, to, to me, and to people I knew, I mean, he was really a good person. He'd do anything for you. As a matter of fact, I have uh, pictures of him. I have pictures of him shooting pool at the pool table with one of my earlier uh, models, well, not model, but client, a woman that I worked with a uh, photograph for a long time. And two of them shooting pool there. And I also, have, I had business cards up on the wall from one of my first companies, which was called Lucky Cole's uh, home repair service was it was the card and my uncle Paul Walker who was a building contractor he had his cards up there he had a whole wall covered in business cards and you walk in they had these uh, cams from Georgia hanging from the ceiling salt and honey I mean just saturated and there'd be a pile of the salt and wow. stuff laying on the floor the wood floor where they uh, where they would be dripping and people actually buy those things, and how you ever ate one, I don't know. But I know, I know that we were there when um, with my uncle. I guess those were the hams they cut up and made for breakfast. Quick question: uh, How yeah. did uh, Monroe Station? Why did Monroe Station get shut down? You remember what well, happened when, with that? When, when, when Joe Lord finally gave up and sold out to uh, the Big Cypress, they um, they they actually did try to get. A vendor to go in there to run it and even talk to the Indians, the Miccosukee or Seminoles, about running it. Nobody really wanted to take it over. It was just too much to do and it needed too many repairs and there was no money in it for anybody. It would have been too hard to make money. Right. So once he sold out and left, but he had the he had the store there, he had the big parking lot where people paid to keep their swamp buggies there, or airboats there. And, and the thing everybody would do if they had their airboat or swamp buggy there, is mainly swamp buggies. I don't really think they had that many airboats ever. But the swamp buggy, if you'd always take your battery out and take it with you. That's fine. Or, or else when you came back, you brought a new one because it would be gone. Wow. If nothing else, you'd kill the battery itself. And, uh, and he had a workshop there. He had like three or four businesses going there at the same time. And when he went to, went to sell out to the National Park Service, 
He listed each business separately. Really? So for them to buy every one of the businesses. I don't know what he finally got for it. He negotiated some kind of a deal, and then he he had a heart condition at the time. He knew his days were numbered. And they bought a place up somewhere off of 27, up above Fish Eating Creek, and uh, 20, yeah, Highway 27. And he was moving everything up there and getting, he wanted, he told me he wanted everything set up and moved for Sue, Quake Sue, his wife, before he died. And that's just about exactly what happened. And what do you, about the time he got everything done and got her moved up there, he, he, he passed away, his heart gave up. Wow. Yeah. What do you think about it being burned down? I think it wasn't an accident. I think it was planned. I think the, uh, people in charge couldn't wait for a uh, storm to come through and blow it down because you could have bumped into it in your pickup truck yep. and the thing would have gone down. And so they just went ahead and burned it. <clears throat> what I want to know is what happened to all of the money, the $500,000 grant that they got from the uh, federal government to restore it 15 years ago. What happened to that money and why didn't they ever use any of it to actually store Monroe Station because that is what they petitioned for.